Welcome to Business Talk, where we're doing the unthinkable. We're making accounting and bookkeeping for small businesses sexy. And it really wouldn't be possible to toss out the gray shoes without the visionaries who are embracing the way that the cloud and technology have really reimagined the way we think about some of the more boring admin uh, aspects of business. Now, uh, it's great to have uh, a special guest joining us today, someone who works for a real global pioneer in this field. In fact, its founder's story involves Lincoln Park and accounting, if you can believe that. Uh, when Zero was planning to list on New Zealand Stock Exchange uh, through its IPO uh, almost 15 years ago, I think now, there was a gag in Kiwi financial circles about the company which said it aimed to upend the accounting industry. And Zero, they'd say, the first IPO named after their revenues. But well over a decade later, the company is proving all of the doubt is wrong. It's got, uh, I think, somewhere around three and a half, four million business customers. Uh, but we'll find out now exactly what the story is because we've got Colin Timmis, who is the country manager for Zero. Uh, Colin, so good to chat to you again. And uh, and so far, we've spoken to entrepreneurs in their own right who are helping other entrepreneurs, the likes of Iridium and Sift. But really, Zero is like the one ring that binds them all in this quest to take the mundane out of the entrepreneurs every day and turn that accounting data also into gold nuggets at the same time. But let's go all the way back. For those who are not familiar with Zero, who is Zero? Because it's got a fascinating founder's story. Yes, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Um, it really is a fascinating story. And uh, one of the quotes that I always remember Rod Drury, the founder, sharing was that the reason he started Zero was that he was tired of looking at accounting software that made his eyes bleed. Um, and I think that's true of, you know, um, so many instances where it's not just the accounting software that makes your eyes bleed, but it's just the entire process of doing accounting for a small business was just hard. Um, and Rod often told the story of how we would have to tra travel across, uh, you know, the island in New Zealand to drop off his files at his accountant to get his books done. And he was an entrepreneur, you know, relatively successful at that stage. Um, and he was just really frustrated with the state of accounting, um, as many people are even in 2024, you know, so many years later, uh, accounting and the conversation around accounting and particularly around accounting software is not something that gets people excited or interested. It, it becomes that, you know, responsibility that many business owners want to abdicate to somebody else. Um, and therein lies the problem that, you know, business owners are not connected to their financial information or their data and able to analyze and understand their businesses as well as they should. And that's not to say that business owners need or have the time to spend hours, um, you know, trawling through reports and spreadsheets, but it's just about being able to use that data in the way that's most useful for the business owner. And that's how, you know, Zero got started. And that's how Rod, um, you know, started the business. And that's how it's grown from, from New Zealand to Australia, the UK, um, and across the globe. And of course, you know, to here in South Africa, where, you know, the Zero story is about bringing small businesses, accountants, apps, um, and members of the community together, enabling them to connect and enabling them to use financial information in a more responsible and visionary way that enables, you know, the growth of these small businesses. Yeah. And, you know, it's such, an, it's such a contradiction almost if you think about the fact that we've got SMEs who are disconnected from a lot of the, the financial uh, data that you speak of, because ultimately what they did was get into business to build something, build a product, deliver a service and, and delight customers. But underlying all of that, we know, is financial sustainability or else a business uh, would, would cease to exist. And so there's a direct link. And it's so important for businesses to tap into their, their financial uh, data and I think there's so much data that that isn't utilized at the SME level. We know big companies, listed companies with huge accounting divisions, and you know chief financial officers. They they can certainly do it. For the SME, it becomes a, a bit of a, a struggle. And you know when I looked at the founder's story and the inspiration behind Zero, it, it was quite fascinating to see that uh, it was really one of these businesses almost in the back of a garage. Um, there were negotiations for a domain name with the Lincoln Park fan site owner. That's how the, the name came to be. What, what do you think all of this reveals about the early culture and the determination with Zero to really change the way we look at accounting? Yeah, I've actually got a picture of um, you know, um, Rod and the first hire sitting in a kitchen uh, developing the first lines of code um, 
4.0, where there was an old, I think it might have been a Motorola or a Nokia phone sitting on the kitchen table as well as they built the first version of Zero. And I often show it uh, to people because it really is a, a remarkable story. And um, I mean, when I first came across Zero, I was running an accounting practice, um, servicing small businesses. Um, and I'm not a, I'm not really, you know, I wasn't really that good at accounting, but I was running an accounting firm. It wasn't my passion. And I was growing increasingly frustrated with the state of accounting and just the lack of support and help and, and community that was out there. And um, I found that very much in the zero brand and the zero business. And even today, I think many small businesses and accountants find that same connection and community. And that's what I think got zero at start. That that's what the the culture was that was developed by Rod and the early founders when the business started was one of look, we're going to build beautiful software that's going to look nice, it's going to do a really good job. But more importantly, the sort of ethos behind the company and the team was that we genuinely want to help people. Like we genuinely want to demystify and remove the frustration out of something that is so important. Um and ultimately, what that leads to is you, you, you're breaking down these barriers that people have in their minds as to what accounting is. Just the, the initial tagline of Zero was beautiful accounting software, which in and of itself tells you, you know there's there's a contradiction that one would expect. But really, when you use the product, um, it it is beautiful and it is easy to use, and it and it, it, it almost dis, disarms you in a way. Um, and and that, isn't that true of all software? You know, whether it's well-known apps we have in our mobile devices, it doesn't, it shouldn't require a huge amount of training and education, and there shouldn't be this fear that then requires you to commit to additional costs and services. It should really be something that's, you know, built into the lifeblood of the company, which is, hey, we want to connect people, make it easier. And that's what Zero did. It it was the first, you know, cloud-based, browser-based um, piece of software that you could run your business on. Um, and and that's that's permeated the entire company. I mean, all the years that I've been involved with Zero, even from when I, you know, first started using it in practice back in, I think it was two thousand and ten, two thousand and eleven. Yeah, and I've you know I've spoken to you on on my radio show a number of times and watched Zero grow in the South African market, which I still think has huge runway for growth, just given the the need to support SMEs, particularly when it comes to linking uh, a business owner and an entrepreneur who often wears the marketing hat, the CFO hat, uh, the CIO hat, all of these different things, and doesn't have the time to their financial data in a way that you say is intuitive, that is engaging, money in, money out. It's not layered with jargon. The, the user interface is very friendly. What kind of growth have you seen? How has Zero benefited the South African entrepreneur in the time that you've been there? Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been remarkable. You know, when we, when we first started, um, I'd regularly get emails from people spelling Zero with a Z, you know. Um, the, no one knew who we were, uh, you know, um, we would run around having meetings, speaking to one or two people, trying to convince um, some of the players in the industry that, you know, Zero was, um, you know, a product worthy of, of support. Whereas now it's exactly the opposite. You know, we get inundated with requests to partner or participate in programs and support initiatives. And, and so we're having to say no a lot more just to maintain our focus. Um, and not in an arrogant way, but in a way where we're, where we're so focused on that growth and that opportunity that you mentioned that one really has to be focused on like what it is that we want to achieve. And, and we are not, um, you know, we are not focused on just doing things and being active and being busy. Like we really are focused on like what are the outputs that we are driving? So what are the core metrics um, that make our business tick? Um, how do we drive those? And what activities and events would help us drive, um, drive those outcomes? So, I think the distractions become more and it becomes harder to say no, but we've just got to be way more in tune with what our outcomes um, have to be and, and we remain focused on that. So still massive runway, massive opportunities. Um, just in the in the digitization space, you know, SARS is embarking on a number of digitization initiatives that are public knowledge, things like VAT digitization, e-invoicing, where like genuinely there is an opportunity to um, enable and connect, um, as we mentioned earlier, small businesses and every other player in the market. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, there's there's a disconnection whether it applies whether it comes to you know how you apply for funding, 
how you connect with um, revenue services, how you um, uh, connect with investors or advisors or you know whatever it may be. There is a there is a disconnected, fragmented environment where we cannot almost scale the ecosystem because there is so much labor and stress involved in shifting paper and data, even if that data is via email or files. Um, in different between silos. Various, yeah, different silos, exactly. Um, just think of them as a silly example. You know, I think back to COVID and all the funding uh, that was available and how people try to access that funding and how much money was simply not deployed because we couldn't get the money to the people. And often the mistake we make, especially in South Africa, is that you know, we think the problem is that there is no no funding available and that we can't connect the small businesses with the institutions. The, the real issue is that the institutions cannot connect with the small businesses. They cannot validate and responsibly engage with these small businesses, enterprises. And so how do we close that gap? And the, the answer is technology um, and working on, on common platforms. Yeah. I, and I mean, if you look at it, I was chatting to Simon Magna um, of Iridium about just how you can help a plumber, for example, from their cell phone, who's very good at their job, um, will come out on a public holiday over Easter to fix a major burst pipe in your home. And uh, you can now invoice you from your phone and everything else is done now on the back end. And you're helping that small business uh, yeah. just build their financial profile in a way that will help them connect to to funders more easily in the future. And I mean, that's a huge output. Um, if you look yeah. at the rise of small businesses in South Africa, and I think you've got a unique vantage point here, uh, and we look at some of the growth numbers at a headline level, we see GDP has been kind of flat for the last almost 10 years, it feels like. We see rising unemployment. It feels like the economy is ex-growth. Yet I interview so many entrepreneurs and small businesses. I'm amazed at the resilience in that particular yeah. sector of the economy. What, what do you see in, in the small business space in, in the country? Yeah, it, it is such a contradiction. You know, it's, um, it's, it's almost... Um, difficult to understand who you should listen to and believe because, um, you know, we just, just to uh, take a, a little detour, we, we did some research about a year ago, I think it was, and we shared this with a lot of our community around well being for small businesses and, and the state of, um, you know, a happiness and satisfaction uh, from small business owners as opposed to employed people around the globe. So we did this survey in Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and South Africa. And out of all the research, the happiest small business owners, the ones who scored the highest, according to the World Health Organization's well-being report, were South Africans. So they, they were the happiest, happier than their counterparts in the UK, Australia, the US, everywhere else. You can go look the research is available online. And and that when I tell people that, they're like, I mean, you're crazy. Like, we are the most unhappy people in the world. And, and it turns out that actually we're not. Actually, small business owners in South Africa are happier than all their counterparts. And together with Singapore, South African small business owners are the only ones with Singapore that have a higher well-being score than people who are employed all over the globe. And on the research we did, so again, there is that natural resilience. And in particular, when people say, "Well, how is that possible?" Well, the reason is that South Africans um, are used to living in um, an environment where there's constant challenge. And so we're more resilient, we're more adaptable. We see things coming along where I like, call this will pass, you know, and then we'll move on to the next, um, the, the next, the next challenge. So there's way more resilience and way more tolerance. Um, coming back to your, your question, every accountant we speak to and every small business owner we speak to, we regularly ask them just that it's not, you know, research based, but it's actual personal feedback on, on their experience. How is business? How are things going? And everyone tells us it's going really well. You know, every accounting firm we speak to, every small business owner, everyone's positive, everyone's doing well. Not everyone. I mean, I'm probably generalizing a little bit, but m most of them are are, are, are are upbeat, optimistic, and and performing well in their business. So, you know, and, and this, this, of course, is a formal sector. This is, of course, the companies that are generally registered for tax, that are paying... Um, paying their dues every month. And of course, there's a whole other cohort of small business owners that are in the informal sector. And of course, then if you listen to people who specialize in the informal sector and tell you about what's going on there 
and the growth and the opportunities. Um, and there's a great book called Cosinomics from G.G. Alcock. I'm not sure if G.G. Alcock, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah if, you've, if you've heard his story or read his book, but I mean, fascinating insights into the informal economy, which again, tells a really positive story about the growth and the investment in those economies. And um, of course, you won't hear any of this in you know some of the some of the news outlets because it's probably not as newsworthy. But it really is. Um, we do we do get a, a really positive sense from the people we speak to on the ground when it comes to accounting, small business, and their the general optimism. Yeah, it reminds me. And I was chatting to Simon about this as well. What the CEO of Nvidia said to a group of MIT students about wishing upon them suffering uh, and struggle because um, most of them are, are quite privileged, um, very bright, very ambitious, and nothing wrong with that. But not many of them would have experienced a lot of struggle or, or suffering necessarily in their lives. Yeah. And he says that's what helped shape him and his view to business, the fact that uh, a bit of struggle, some suffering helps you work through a problem, a challenge, get up every day, dust yourself off. And I think South Africa has more than enough of that. And why, to your point, yep. we've got such a resilient SME sector. And, um, you know, that that yep. second economy, I remember Tabo and Becky first coining the term years ago, is strong. You know, to your point of what Gigi Alcock, um, what the guys at Yoko are saying as well, it, you know, it, it, but it needs it needs support. And this is where I think um, cloud accounting software has an, a huge role, a huge runway to play and grow in South Africa. W what specific projects has Xero been involved in um, ar around the SME space recently? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we support um, the accounting um, community directly. So that's one of our main, what we call channels. And, and so we're connected with accountants and our goal is to upskill those accountants, not just to provide them with software. Um, in, in a way, accounting software is almost the least of what Xero does. Like we're, we're, we build great software, but we're also really interested in educating accountants to better support SMEs. So not all accountants are equal and some accountants, you know, um, you know, have a very uh, outdated approach to what it means to be an accountant and the type of advice and insight you can gather. So part of our focus in supporting SMEs is, well, how do we educate accountants on perhaps to evolve their business model and their practices, you know, things like- but Do they feel threatened? Um, I, I would say some some feel threatened, but many do embrace um, embrace the change. I think many have realized, you know, um, not to coin the old AI phrase, but we, we just announced a, pr a product coming later this year called Jax, which is called Just Ask Zero. And to give you an idea, you know, you'll, you'll ask the app um, or ask the product, um, how many you know debtors invoices do I have outstanding? Which is the biggest one, or when last did they pay me? And then the 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 app will tell you back who those are. So if you, if you're an accountant who does not even have your financial data up to date, now traditional accountants would only update an SME's accounting data maybe once a year, maybe twice a year for provisional tax, maybe every two months if they're really good for VAT, but it's not up to date every week. And this is the world that we we support. We're saying, no, no, your information needs to be updated daily. It needs to be reconciled and up to date. Um, you know, if not daily, then maybe every week, but surely not longer than that. Because how else, if you're a business owner, can you analyze your sales and see what products are moving in your store or not moving? That comes from your financial information. It can't be separate. It's got to be part and reconciled to your bank statements every week or every day. And so if that information is updated, now you can deploy the machine learning and the AI to do things like what insights can you generate for me um, uh, about my business? And so you're not and, asking and your accountant. But but surely that's then the role of the accountant to be able to lean into this software and data as yeah. well to be almost a strategic advisor to the entrepreneur. Yeah, I think I think there are two schools of thought there. I think some accountants, yes, they will lean and move into that advisory space where that is their inclination. You know, they want to build a practice that is say, leveraging technology to provide insights and management services and guidance. But the reality is not all accountants want to be advised. Some accountants want to be, you know, technically excellent at tax planning and um, structures and efficiency and accuracy and that sort of thing. And, and that's fine. And then you'll get some accountants who have got a balance of two. Now, the skill is, um, or, or the, te the learning for accountants is, well, which, are, which do they want to be? You know, what, what is their value proposition? And for many accountants, unfortunately, A, they don't ask themselves that question. And B, 
They do not communicate what that value is to their customer. And so they're onboarding all the wrong customers. So part of our job, if you ask how do we support SMEs, is probably partly to educate accountants on how do you get your business model right? What is your value proposition? And then how do you communicate that to the market to attract your right customers? Then there's other work, obviously, we do with, um, you know, in the enterprise supply development space with accountants. Uh, we've got a program that we run with FNB moving into its third year now as well, trying to raise up and support um, accountants because there, there is a shortage of accountants, you know, so there's more than enough work for accountants as well, but there is a shortage of them. Um, and then a number of other SME community-based organizations we support to help with education and, and, and raising up, uh, you know, more, more sustainable SMEs. It's a, a lot of work. I'm sure you're very busy at the moment. Uh, when we look ahead, uh, what do you envision for Zero's future in South Africa in this uh, approach to partnering with small businesses and partnering with accountants? And how do you think its experience in the past will inform the strategies and decisions moving forward? Yeah, I think um, I, you know. I think we're in a fortunate position where, if we look back ten years, um, that I've been involved in the business and the industry. Um, I remember clearly what it was like when no one was interested in doing cloud accounting. Like if, if you ask people, you know, to move their books to the cloud, the response was, you know, is it safe? You know, someone's going to steal my information as I hear about your, your, um, your information that much. But um, I remember what that was like. And I f it feels now as though um, the, the next opportunity, I think, is, is to really build an, a, a cohesive like integrated SME community. You know, if, if, if I look to the SME space, there's so it's, it's very fragmented, it's very disconnected. Um, there are uh, different approaches um, and it's almost like there's no, there's no foundational base on which the SME community can, can thrive. And I think our goal is uh, like unapologetically to be the voice for small business in South Africa and to create a community where Whatever it is you need, like the resources there, whether it's accounting software, whether it's funding, whether it's payment services, advisory support, you know, access to markets internationally. I mean, that's one of the things we don't talk about often, but if you build an app to zero, there's a great product uh, called Sift from Vangelis where they, they now sell the product in the US and Australia because it's one API, it's one product. So access to markets, you know, it, it's all that type of thing where, where we can build a cohesive, supportive environment where everyone knows that, look, you know, this is the platform and the infrastructure for small businesses, and then all the support is surrounding that, whether it's app supports, advisory supports, funding supports. Um, and it's a bit more intentional because right now it feels and has felt for a while like there's a whole lot of little players. Um, and then this is the challenge is that it doesn't take um, a huge business to make a little bit of money in the small business space. You know, you only need 400, 500, 600, you know, 700 SME clients, have a little community have them pay you a fee, maybe have a newsletter that goes out to, you know, a couple of thousand SMEs, and you can probably have a relatively sustainable business. But I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of small businesses. Um, you look at the SARS tax stats, you know, you've got 450 odd thousand VAT registered companies, 650,000 payroll registered companies. So, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of SMEs that need the infrastructure support and community to help them thrive and to make them sustainable. Um, and, and in particular, to start with those companies that are already employing. So how do we consolidate, support, and accelerate those companies that are already employing people, already paying tax? I think those for, for us, I think, are the priority. Um, and then there is a space for startups and the SMEs, but they're different. It's, it's not, you know, not everyone's an entrepreneur. I think we also get lost on the word entrepreneur and business owner. There is a distinction. Every person who runs a business is not necessarily an entrepreneur, and that's fine. Maybe it's one company you run. That makes you means you're a business owner, not an entrepreneur. Uh, so how do we foster that environment and that culture get clearer on you know, even the language? And sorry, I'm a bit of a, a rant here, but the SME, like why do we say SME? They're like small, medium enterprises. They're not enterprises. You know, so we've coined the phrase SMEs, you know, small, small and medium, medium businesses. And so, so let's change the terminology. Let's talk about SMBs. Like why do we say SMEs, SMMEs? I mean, it's... We need to get consistent language, consistent framing of who the audience is, who we're going after, because the solutions are all vastly different. 
vastly different from startups to entrepreneurs to business owners uh, to high growth yeah. scale ups exactly and exactly I, I, you know i think in that space that you you talk about creating an ecosystem for it is very much the business owner versus the entrepreneur and the ones still left after covid after load shedding and everything else that this economy has thrown at them have demonstrated that they've got the ability to continue to manage through whatever challenges uh, but they are the ones that can really grow and become, you know, more yeah. sustainable, more scalable, employ more people. And I think that's where we can have an outsized impact. If you think of every single one of those businesses uh, employing two or three or four more people, what an impact that would have on the broader South African economy as well. So yeah. uh, it, it's it's a big approach because I, I, I agree with you. The, the space is very fragmented. There's almost a, a different organization or industry grouping or body that speaks to a different niche part of the market but nothing that really brings it all together so yeah, um, and a lot of yeah and and a lot of the efforts um they can be almost um you know they're almost like donations rather than investments like we have to take the approach of creating sustainable businesses that we believe are going to grow and and i think um if anybody wants a reality check just go and have a look at the SARS tax stats um, and you realize how many companies there are that are making profits, that are paying tax. Um, I think the latest stats were 67.1% of all company income tax is paid by like 300-odd companies in South Africa. And if you exclude commodity price, uh, prices and um, some of the larger companies, you're left with very little. There's 170,000 companies registered for actual SME, SME tax, um, the ta tax rate. So... It's a really small environment and it's really easy to measure your outcomes. That's what we're focused on is how do we increase the SARS tax stats number? You know, it's, it's not about the, the other aspects that are more, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook based that make things look really impressive. We're like, where are the sustainable businesses? How do we help them grow and then encourage more to enter the funnel? And the reality of our entire economy is built on not the budget speech, it's built on the tax stats because that's the homework that's coming home to roost and that's what we've got to focus on. Fantastic. Uh, great chatting to you, Colin Timmers, Country Manager for uh, South Africa at Zero, and uh, wish you uh, great success in achieving that goal because South Africa needs this kind of approach if we are truly to make, as Jack Ma said, our small business owners the everyday heroes, much like China did, to great success as well. And I recall when he came here in 2018 to the investment conference, imploring President Soro Ramaphosa to do exactly that. So great to see a leader in the private sector taking up the cudgels. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Michael.